Wow. So today we're going to actually, we're going to carry Easter just another week farther, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about the Easter story today. We don't know why he was there. We know he was a servant. Um, some say, some translations call him a slave. Um, <clears throat> and most likely he was actually a slave to the high priest. Um, he was ordered to go to the Garden of, of uh, likely was ordered to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, on that Monday Thursday night, that first Monday Thursday. Um, however, it is possible that he just got kind of wrapped up. We know Holy Week on, on Palm Sunday, there were people there that didn't know they were going to be out there cheering Jesus on as he came into town until they got wrapped up with the people, right? We know that, that when it came to time for Jesus to be, to be in that mock trial, that there were people who were there who weren't initially on board, but suddenly were drawn in by all the other people going that direction so that they all were hollering crucify him. We know that. We know it's very likely that as this mob starts heading to the garden to arrest Jesus, most likely they picked up some debris along the way. Well, there was more collected to it, that, that magnetism of that activity, right? And we know that we, we've seen it, if you've watched any Westerns, starts out one guy's all mad about something, and as he gets drunk in the bar in the Old West, right, and suddenly he gets more people gathered to him, and pretty soon pretty, there's more, and they got a mob going to the jail, right? We know that activity draws people in, and so it's very possible that this man may have, maybe that's all it was, was just activity. Maybe his boss didn't send him, but, but likely he did. We know that this man not only became part of the mob, but he also ends up in the forefront of the mob. He also is in the forefront of the story of Jesus Christ in the garden. And he, he, he actually has his own eerie story, if you will. Okay. And so you might be getting on to where I'm going, right? And so, right? And so we know that he was, he was uh, the, the servant, the slave of Caiaphas. We know he was the ears. The scholars have figured out that he's, these servants, typically speaking, would be the ears of the high priest around town. So they're hearing what other religious leaders are saying, and they're taking it back to their high priest. They're, they're hearing what maybe the Roman soldiers are talking about, and they're taking it back to the high priest. They're hearing what maybe in this case he was hearing what Jesus was teaching, and it was one of those relaying it to the high priest. We know, we know he was there, and as a follower of Jesus Christ, we know that it wasn't accidental that he was there maybe he didn't know he was going to be there but it was not uh, it was according to God's plan not according to his and we know he ends up at the forefront face to face with Jesus we can trust that he, as a, he, he was there as an observer we can trust that he was unarmed he was a servant he was a slave he was not a soldier um, he, he was so he we can we can trust the fact he was unarmed. He probably was not expecting any any violence because we know that Jesus taught to love your enemy, right? Hey, he's the one who said turn the other cheek. We know that his his crew wasn't out there causing bloodbaths, right? We know they weren't troublesome. They weren't known to be armed warriors. So he likely in the front of that in the front of that mob, he likely felt pretty comfortable there, especially with all the guards around him. They came to arrest Jesus. And as he's in the front of this mob that he very likely, maybe he didn't even intend to be out front. You ever been in that group where it's like the teacher wants to know who's going to, and everyone else either steps back or, or they push someone forward, right? Maybe that happened to him. I don't know. We don't know. That's not, that's not no. But it's, so for whatever reason, he's in the front. I trust that it was because of God's plan. We know that suddenly there was probably a flicker of, 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 of light off of a sword. We know that suddenly he, he felt a pain on the side of his head. We know that suddenly he would have put his hand to his head, felt that warm, sticky, bloody goo coming down where his ear used to be. We also know that Jesus, the man they were coming to arrest, this guy who was causing all the ruckus, according to the high priest, we know that he reached down 
and reattached the ear or grew a new one. We don't, it doesn't tell us what she did. But he healed the ear. We know that. We know there was a lot leading up to this night. We know there was a lot leading up to this point. We know that when Jesus put that ear back on, most likely that pain that he had it was gone. We know most likely because we do it, right? When something, when something happens and then we go, and then, oh, wait, no, it's back. Right? It was gone a minute ago. It was oozing. And, but wait, it's back because of this guy that we're getting ready to arrest that my boss wants dead. We know that uh, by this point, we know as we study the Gospels, we know that uh, at this point, Jesus is he's already gone. He's had the Last Supper. He's, he's instituted communion. He's, he's, uh, he's already washed the disciples' feet. He's already told Peter he's going to deny him three times. He's already said that there's one amongst them who's going to betray him, and then he sends Judas out. We know that the remaining 11 had gone with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane to, so Jesus could have some time with the Lord, and they were supposed to be there praying for him, and they went to sleep instead. We know that. And we know suddenly there was a ruckus. Suddenly there was this mob there who, who would have lit up the dark with their torches as they came in because we know just even a candle will t- send away a lot of, lot of darkness, let alone multiple torches amongst this whole mob. We know this whole ear thing is important because it's recorded in all four Gospels. We, we also know, though, that this is, is important enough to be reported in all four Gospels about Jesus' last uh, uh, recorded uh, um, pre-crucifixion miracle. We know that. We know. We know. That John's the only one who tells us the name of the swordsman and the name of the earless man. For whatever reason, whether the other three thought, you know, this whole miracle thing, not important anymore. Or whether they thought this Malchus, nobody knows him, not important anymore. But they introduce us, uh, but John introduces us to Malchus. John 18, verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Maybe you're wondering, why would Peter do that? I personally, I personally, and I've felt this way for a very, very long time, I think Malchus was very fortunate that Peter probably skipped Swordsman 101 class to go fishing. Because remember, he's used to a fillet knife, not a sword. Okay, I'm thinking Peter didn't intend to only take an ear. He's not Zorro, right? Um, I'm thinking that it, that it was a glancing blow. It was a, it was a wild blow by a wild swing by a man who's not used to a sword. And again, I'm also thinking it's God's plan. It was God's plan. Peter, not long before this, had vowed to go to his death to protect Jesus. We know he's probably not out there just thinking, oh, I'll take a little nip off here and a little nip off there, right? Luke shares another little uh, tidbit for us, a unique tidbit for us. It says in, in Luke 22, verse 50, 51, says, And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this! And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Luke, being a physician, remember, he's a doctor. Doctor's in the house, right? These healings, he's a man who's dedicated his life to healing. And and so this would be of importance to him. The disciples, some of the other disciples, um, the other three authors of, of the Gospels maybe didn't get to see. They didn't have the right view of that because we know they all were nervous and scared, and we know that they all spread like cockroaches in the light when, when Jesus gets arrested. We know that they do all flee. So maybe the other three just didn't see it, but I think it had a lot more to do with the fact that Luke is the physician, and he's like, this is a miraculous healing once again. 
the rest of them probably it may may not have seen the hearing loss incident, but but I just believe it was Luke and his physician's viewpoint. Malchus is mentioned only only once in scripture other than this one. And the only other time he's mentioned is is as an incidental, if you will. Uh, in, in, and it's John who also mentions him then. It's John 18, 26, where he sa- it says, One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? And from there, Malchus is no more. He's not spoken of ever again in Scripture. Disappears, kind of like the disciples when the mob showed up. We know this was an important, uh, God doesn't do anything just because. He doesn't orchestrate a plan just because. We know God had a plan to it. We know that, that this, this momentary time was a time, this momentary incident was, was an incident of utmost importance as far as God's concerned because he made sure it was in his word, which is for we're to take every word to heart, we're to know every word, we're to learn from every word. God wants us to understand some things here, and something we need to understand here is that now that Malchus, is, Malchus lost an ear for a moment, but now that Malchus had an ear, he was able to hear. And the first thing that I want to share with you that he was able to hear, he heard that Jesus was crucified. He heard Jesus was crucified. And some of you may be like, well, he probably was there, and he probably was. But if he wasn't, he definitely was the ears of the high priest, so he definitely would have heard Jesus has been crucified. We don't know how big of an impact, really, honestly, we don't know how big of an impact the crucifixion was on Jerusalem in that moment, in the time, right? At the time of the crucifixion, of that night. There's a big shindig for us as far as we're concerned. It's a big event, right? This is something major, but we're followers of Jesus Christ. And if we think about it, in that day in Jerusalem, um, it was not that big of a deal because the Romans, Romans were crucifying people all the time. There was constantly people hung along the roads into town sending a message to those who might defy the Roman authority. Think about it. Jesus is hanging there on trumped-up charges, Again, only by God's plan, right? But on trumped up charges, and he's got a he's got a thief on either side who's being put to death for stealing something. If they're gonna kill you for stealing something, they're gonna kill you because they made up some stuff about you. Guess what? The ones who deserve it, yeah, their their crucifixion was not unusual. So the crucifixion of these three people wasn't necessarily anything of big news to the city of Jerusalem, to the people of Jerusalem. They were, that's old hat to them. They were, they were callous to it. So not everyone would have known. Not everyone would have. Malchus knew, though. I guarantee you Malchus knew, as Caius, Caiaphas's little spy, his ears in the crowd. Because you know Caiaphas knew, right? And, and they were doing the celebration dance. Right, they they knew they had they they had the gathering. Shoot, they 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 were all these people were right there. Remember when Peter denied God, denied Jesus, denied knowing Him. <clears throat> Malchus knew he was there for the arrest. He knew he knew he'd been arrested. Guarantee you, Malchus knew he'd been tortured. Guarantee he knew he'd been crucified. Malchus knew. On the day that Jesus was crucified, I'm betting that Malchus was there. We don't have scripture to back that up. But I'm betting he was because the religious leaders were there, and Caiaphas was the high priest. Guess what? Caiaphas, as the high priest, is going to be there, right? And if Caiaphas is there, his ears are going to be with him. Malchus is going to be there. Malchus would have seen, would likely have seen the crucifixion. He likely would have been there, uh, Malchus would have been there as they watched Jesus be nailed to the tree, as they watched him be lifted up, 
He would have heard the thump, thump, thump of the of the nails being pounded in. He would have he would have heard the screams of agony from the three people being crucified. He would have been there when Jesus said, "Woman, this is your son." So, John, this is your mother. As he provided for his mother for life. He would have been there then. He would have been there when Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He would have been there. He would have heard the words. He also would have heard the words, it is finished. Malchus was there. And because he had an ear, he could hear. And we can look back, even even atheists can go and look back, and it's historically recorded that Jesus was crucified. It is written down in the books. For the naysayers, it's written down in the books. For those of us who believe, we just know because we have one particular book, and that's all the proof we need. So he knew Jesus had been crucified on that original Good Friday. But because he had an ear, he heard also, number two, that Jesus was buried. He heard that Jesus was buried. He might not have been there. He didn't see it necessarily, but he heard because he hears everything for the high priest, Caiaphas. And it isn't just a natural conclusion that they would have all been buried because it wasn't even a natural conclusion that people who were crucified were buried because the reality is most of the time they weren't buried. William Barclay um, in in his daily study Bible says, it frequently happened that the bodies of criminals were never buried at all but were simply taken down and left for the vultures and the scavenging wild dogs to deal with. In fact, it has been suggested that Golgotha may have been called the place of a skull because it was littered with skulls from previous crucifixions. So it was not a foregone conclusion, Jesus is dead, now he's buried. But Malchus would have heard that he was buried. Because I guarantee you, Caiaphas and the other priests who railroaded Jesus were partying down. They were having a good time. He's out of our hair. He's no longer our problem. He's dead, and he's in the tomb. In fact, they didn't trust that the, that the, the disciples wouldn't come back. His, Jesus' followers wouldn't come and steal the body and pretend there was a resurrection. So they had Pilate seal the tomb and post guards. I wonder, I wonder how heavy that was on Mary's heart as she stood there watching her son be crucified and as she stood there, or maybe by this time is on her knees, maybe by this time is on her face before his cross. But she wonders, how am I going to care for my boy? How am I going to care for my child? She wants his body cared for in the Jewish tradition. The problem is, They're still from Nazareth. It's a little more than a rock throw away. And it's on the eve of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is almost upon them. The body needs to be brought down, needs to be tended to, needs to be hauled, and then put away into a tomb. I wonder how heavy that was on Mary's heart. But thanks to Joseph, he gave Jesus his tomb. He offered up his tomb and made sure he was placed in the tomb. The story could have ended here. He's dead. He's in the tomb. We saw it. Malchus heard it. He knows he's in the tomb. Caiaphas, all the other priests, they know he's in the tomb. All the other, the Romans, they know he's in the tomb. The Roman soldiers are right there protecting that sealed tomb. They know he's in the tomb. It's over. We have victory. That was on Friday. That was also on Saturday for them. It was probably a bit of a long party. But then Sunday's coming. I wonder, though, 
if on Friday and Saturday, as, as Malchus is probably translating, sharing the story, because, hey, guys, we, 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 we hunt, we fish, we tell stories, right? And so I wonder how many times he told the story of his ear being cut off, and then Jesus healed his ear. I wonder how many times the pain got increasingly worse. I wonder how many times it went from a few drops of blood to maybe gallons of blood. How many times the story grew because I caught a fish this big, right? Oh, yeah. Yep, no, it was this big, right? And so I wonder how many times he told that story. I wonder how many times he thought to himself, wait a minute, he healed my ear. My ear was cut off. Blood's going every, And he just reached down and he healed my ear. Why did he not come off the cross? I wonder if that wasn't a question in Malchus's mind. I would like to think it would certainly have been one in my mind. We know the Roman soldier said, if you're, if you're the son of God, if you're, you're all this, you're the Messiah, then save yourself. We know that one criminal did the same thing. I wonder if Malchus didn't do the same. Only he had a little closer relationship with Jesus as far as the healing power Jesus had. I wonder if, if his thought of Jesus went from him being, wow, he's a miracle worker, to maybe it was a thing where he's like, well, maybe my ear wasn't cut that bad. Maybe it wasn't actually gone. Maybe it was more like a razor burn cut thing. Maybe it wasn't really bleeding as bad as I thought because otherwise he would have saved himself. Was he really, the, you know, I mean, he was, a, talk to the people, right? I listen to people. That's Malchus, right? Mr. Ears. I listen to the people and, man, they're all talking about how great a guy he was, how wonderful of a man he was, how loving he was, how, how, how gentle he was, except for when he was in the temple and he was mad about his father's house. He was a, he was a really great guy. In fact, he was a pretty good ear reattacher guy. He was pretty good at that. But now he's dead and he's buried. He might have been good, but obviously he couldn't have been God. But then there's Sunday. And because he had an ear, he heard. He heard Jesus had risen. Sunday morning, he heard Jesus had risen. Because he had an ear, he could hear, and he heard Jesus had risen. The plan for the religious leaders, they're thinking it all went great. He's dead, he's in the tomb, all that. And then Sunday morning comes, and Malchus comes and tells Caiaphas, Hey, boss, guess what? Caiaphas's great party suddenly comes to a crashing halt. Of course, they accused the, the Roman guards of all going to sleep. They accused that all oh, the apostles came in and stole the body. They're faking the resurrection. The resurrection could have happened really quietly. It really could have. Right? God's, God's good at this stuff, right? Just like all of a sudden, whoop, there he is, right? Could have, he, could have, he could have done it without any pomp and circumstance. But he didn't. Why? Because he's God. And it was a big deal. And he wanted us all to know. Right? So he sends an angel down. He sends an angel down. He, 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 may, he makes a little noise. In Matthew 28, verse 2, it says, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Conquering angel, Right? And sat on it, his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Some translations say they fainted. Talk about emotional highs and lows, right? I mean, come on, right? Because they're, they're, all these religious leaders, all those who wanted him dead, man, they're way up on the mountaintop. And now they're down in the deepest, deepest deepest pit they're not in the valley they're below the valley suddenly everything they thought is now exploded it's all imploded it's all gone to garbage
And then they're like, well, but maybe, maybe there's still them apostles, them disciples. Maybe they still had something to do with this, right? But then we go on to, to um, Matthew 28, verse 11. It says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And they're like, oh, crud. It's not just another story. Malchus didn't just hear it wrong. It truly is what it is. We don't hear from Malchus anymore. We know the story. We know Jesus lived. We know he died for us. We know he was buried. We know he rose again. We know the story. Malchus now has heard the story. He knows the story as well. He's been listening in our conversations. Well, we're, I think we're fooling ourselves if we believe that, oh, he just never heard any of Jesus' teachings. Jesus is one of the ones that the high priests were spying on the most, the more than anyone else. You know Malchus heard his teachings. But we don't hear from Malchus anymore. And here's the thing, though. Malchus heard of his death. He heard of his burial. He heard of his resurrection. And, and, but here's the thing. So now he knows the important thing isn't what did he hear, but what did he do with what he knows? What did he do with what he knows? What did Malchus now do? Did he, did he, um, take it to heart? Did he follow Jesus? Did he, We don't know if he became a follower or believer of Jesus Christ. I'd like to believe with that kind of an encounter. I would like to believe he did. But we don't know that. It's not in our scriptures anywhere that he did. It's not there anywhere. The high priests, they're all freaked out, right? Because now if Jesus is alive, that means that if if by crucifying him it proved that they were right and he was wrong, his resurrection solidifies the fact that he was right and the religious leaders were wrong. When Malchus sees this, you think it has to have an impact because you know Caiaphas isn't going to be quiet about it. He was a loudmouth. We don't know what Malchus did. We don't know if he chose to deny Jesus uh, and the experience he, uh, that he, he'd seen, that what he'd experienced himself. We don't, we don't know if he decided to deny that. We don't know if he, wanted, if he decided to make up stories about his ear. Well, maybe it was just that little scratch and over time. He didn't tell it anymore. You know how it is. You tell that really big fish story until you catch a bigger fish, you know. And then so you, know, and then, so you tell that story. So you, maybe did he forget about this story? Did he forget all about it and get to a point where no longer does he even think about it? Think about that, th- th- this Jesus that, that reattached his ear. He wouldn't deny the death or the burial of Jesus, but, but, but that, that resurrection thing, that's a little heavy, man. That's a little hard to swallow. That's a whole new level, right? Because if he accepts the resurrection, then he has to accept that Jesus Christ is who he proclaimed he was, the Son of God. He has to accept that. If he accepts the resurrection, he has to accept what he heard Jesus teach. He has to accept what Jesus requires of us as followers of Jesus Christ. He now has to make some changes in his life. He has to decide. He has to determine, do I believe it or do I deny it? If I believe it, that means that Jesus, according to Jesus, my life has to change. As a follower of Jesus Christ, if I become one of them, now my life has, I've got my life and I like my life the way it is. I'm I'm Caiaphas' ears. I get to listen to all the good, good, juicy gossip. I get to hear all this, and I get to go rat people out. I kind of enjoy it. But if the resurrection is real, if I buy into the resurrection, man, that means i got to stop the gossip because he talked about that. 
I can no longer tell lies because he talked about that. I can no longer betray people because he talked about that. If Malchus accepts the resurrection, it means Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. And he is to follow him if he wants to spend eternity in heaven. We don't know if Malchus accepted or denied Jesus Christ. We don't know, but what I hope, and someday in eternity, maybe we'll find out. Of course, I might not even care anymore. By the time I'm in eternity, I'm hoping I got like no words, man. Let's just sing some stuff, which I don't, you heard me, (laughs) you know, and God gave me the voice so he gets to hear it, okay? So, right, it's all right. Uh, my 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 prayer is that Lord, man, I don't even I don't even want to care about anything that was down here. All I want is to spend it my eternity in the presence of you and your Son, the one who died and was resurrected. The one I know is your Son. I just want to spend presence in you, right? So I hope I don't even think about it. But so someday we could, if you if that question is really eating at you. You can ask that question one day, because you're going to have eternity, so you can ask lots of questions, right? And so, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But what I hope, what I hope is that because he had an ear and he heard, he chose to act on it. I hope that he chose to act on it. I say hope because prayer does no good at this point. Once we're dead, prayer's done. I can't pray for you to get into heaven. If you're already dead, that's what you have to do before dying. Anyone tells you you could pray your loved ones into heaven's a liar. You could pray they come to know Jesus, but they got to be alive for it. You can't make the decision. You can't choose to follow Jesus when you're done breathing. When there's no more pulse, there's no more choice. The decision's been made. And even if you're like, but what if I hadn't actually made up my mind yet? I was thinking I wanted to, but I didn't expect the car crash. The decision was yours to make. And by not making the decision, you made a decision. And you will spend eternity where you made your decision. So I hope that Malchus decided he made the decision. Jesus truly is the Son of God. I will follow him. I want him to be my Lord. I truly hope that. Maybe the story wasn't about the garden in and of itself. We don't even know how, where did Malchus come from, right? We were like, so why does he show up? He's there for a couple sentences, boom, gone, Right? But it, it's possible, if we look back at John uh, eighteen twenty six, if we look back at we, which we read earlier, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? W- looking at that, then John, John's the only one who knew, who used Malchus's name. They all wrote about the incident. He's the only one who identifies who Malchus was. It's possible that maybe John knew the relative, and heard the story. It's actually possible maybe John had met Malchus. It's very, very possible that Malchus becomes a follower. Maybe, maybe John had the privilege of baptizing Malchus into the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Maybe, maybe, right? We don't know. Maybe the story is more instead of about Malchus. Maybe it's for us 2,000 years later. There's a lot of people we don't know. There's a lot of people who know Jesus died. They know he was buried. They know he was resurrected. But they have not acted on it. There's a lot of people in this world who sit in chairs like this on a Sunday morning. Sit in hard wooden pews. You guys got it made on Sunday morning. The problem with having it made is sometimes we get comfortable. And we sit in our cushion and we never act on what we know. I believe Malchus's story is for you and for me. 
he knew. He heard. He only heard because Jesus gave him an ear to hear. Jesus gave him an ear to hear the rest of the story. You and I have ears already. We can hear the rest of the story. He don't need to reattach it, but he will create a miracle. He will perform a miracle, do a miracle in your heart, in your life, if you will hear and act on it. Something's going to happen in your life one way come the other. If you hear and reject... There's a destiny for you. If you hear and you act on it and start following Jesus Christ, there's a destiny for you. And maybe we get to meet Malchus. And we're definitely going to meet Jesus. We're definitely going to meet God. Right? And, and so come on now. Right? That, that's some good stuff, ain't it? All we got to do is act on it. I believe Malchus's story is for us to act on. I believe that's what it's all about. And I believe there's some who are sitting here, and God's been asking them to act. He's been calling them to act. He's been saying, come on now. We just got done celebrating my son's death and his resurrection. Come on now. Are you about to become live in Christ or not? Or are you going to remain dead in Jesus Christ? I believe God's saying this morning to some of you all, are you going to act on it? Will you act or will you continue to deny? I'm calling you to take a step. I'm calling you forward. I'm calling you to get on your knees before me. I'm calling you to submit. I'm calling you to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior right now. That's what he's saying. I believe this message is not for Malchus. It's for you and it's for me. And I believe there's some who sit here and we say, well, no, because I already know Jesus. I already believe in Jesus. There's a difference between believing and following. It's night and day. Believing only gets you to hell. But wait a minute. I don't care what your preacher told you. The Bible tells us we're to be followers of Jesus Christ. Even the demons believe, it says, and shudder. The devil's minions believe in Jesus and shudder. He wants us to act, and he's calling us to act. And I believe that today there are some in this room, there are some online, who today he's saying, I want you to act. I want you to step forward. I want you to start a new life, a new life in Jesus, a new life in my son who gave everything for you who took on every sin of the world, not just your piddly little sins, but every sin in the world. He took it on himself. He suffered under every sin of the world, every sin already and every sin to come. Every sin of the world he took upon himself. He suffered the pain, the agony, the scrutiny of that because he loves you and he wants you to join him in heaven for eternity but it will not happen if you do not follow him. It will not happen. Some of you may be like, why do I got to do it today? You're bugging me again. Right? Because we do that. I'm glad, glad a bunch of you laughed anyway, okay? Um, it's because I don't have my long distance glasses. I can't even see which all you didn't. So, um, but uh, he, he, he died for us. He died for us, and he wants us to be alive in him. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2 says, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Why today? Why do I got today? But I got things going on. I have a party planned. Oh, but I got this chick I got my eyes on. Oh, but I'm not living my life right now. I don't, well, man, it's a lot of upheaval if I do that today. Why today? I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now is. Right now is the right time. Today is the right time. Not tomorrow, not the next day. Not a month from now, not a year from now. 
You know not that you're going to get past that door. In fact, today we're doing potluck, okay? You know not you're not going to choke on some chicken. Okay, I'm just saying. I don't even know if there's chicken out there, but <laughs> let's be honest, right? You better hope everyone around you likes you, okay, because someone's going to help then, right? Today's the day of salvation. We aren't promised anything beyond this. I could come down off these steps, fall, hit my head on the side of the chair. I'm done. If I haven't made the decision before that, it's over. You could get up, trip off your chair, step on a water bottle, something, fall, bang, done. But I was going to. God's word said today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the time. James 4, 14 says, why, do you, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Done. P done. P done. Life after life after life. P done. We don't even know it's going to be gone like that. Now is the time. Mark 4, 9 says, Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear today. I pray that you have ears to hear. Pray that today, today you'll stop being self-centered and become Christ-centered. Today you'll accept what he did on and through that cross, that whole celebration, that whole Holy Week thing that we just did. I pray that today, today, that hits home with you. You hear it new again today, and today you act upon it. Today you do. Not tomorrow, not this afternoon, not after lunch, because with my chicken. God, give us a sense of humor, too. So Today, today, I pray that today, right now, in this moment, in this moment, Father God, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you so much. Jesus, thank you. You, you, you took it all for us. You took it all upon yourself for us. You took the pain for us. You took the suffering for us. You took the sin for us. You took the nails for us. You took the cross for us. You took the whip for us. You took the rods for us. You took the crown of thorns for us. You took the mockery, the spitting, the beating for us. You took the tomb for us. Jesus, today, we talked about Malchus's ear and how you gave him an ear to hear. And Father God, you've given all of us two ears to hear. And Jesus, I pray that in this moment, in this moment, the work you did through the cross and through the tomb, the work that you did by taking upon our sin, upon yourself, I pray that today, in this moment, Father God, I pray that someone here, someone here, I pray that they're going to give their life to you. They're going to step forward. They're going to act on it. That it is no longer just a good book. It's no longer Jesus was just a good dude. It's no longer Jesus, well, he did some stuff for us. But instead, it's no longer just that, well, we've we'll got to celebrate with some eggs and chocolate. But rather, Father God, that it would be now, today, today, today it strikes home in the heart. Today there's a heart given over to you. In this time, a heart given to you. Maybe it's a heart given back to you as well, Father God, because I believe there's some of those in here. We have hearts that are, man, we, we've taken our own heart back. We took it out of your hands. And, Father God, I ask that right now, right now in this time, hearts would be handed to you. Right now in this time, they'd be laid at the foot of your throne. Jesus Christ, I ask that, that, that now they'd be laid at the foot of your cross. It's so easy to do. But we have to choose. We have to act. And I want to lead you. If you're not, and I'm not one into it, there's no perfect prayer. There's not. If you don't say it the way I said it, it don't matter. Speak from your heart to our Father. Speak from your heart to our Savior. 
Just, Jesus, I've been living it my way. My life has been my life. And I know that's wrong. I know I've been doing it wrong. I, I've been living it according to what the world lives life. But in this moment, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want a new life. I want a new life in you, Jesus. In this moment, I just want a new life in you, Jesus. From this moment on, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm not saying I'm going to get it perfect. I'm still going to mess up, and you know that. And I thank you for going to the cross for those sins as well. But from this day on, I will live my life according to your will, according to your word, according to your example, Jesus, from this day forward, I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. Father God, I thank you for receiving each one of those who just said that. Each one of those who said it in whatever way they said it. You hear the heart. And I thank you for hearing the hearts today. And Father God, I rejoice with you for the new lives in Christ starting today. I rejoice with you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us ears to hear. It's in your name that we pray.